Hello and welcome to Glasgow Doors Open Day's Digital Festival. This event will begin soon, but first we have a brief housekeeping message. So that you can get the most out of this session, we'd like to point out a few features of Zoom. By clicking on the buttons at the bottom of the Zoom window, you will be able to access the chat room, and if you are in a webinar, you will also be able to make use of the Q&A function. The Q&A function is so that you can ask specific questions of the speaker, which they will be able to answer time allowing at the end of the session. Use the chat room to contribute more generally to the discussion or to share links and resources. When using these features, please mind your P's and Q's. Both will be monitored and recorded. Most sessions will be recorded and uploaded to Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival YouTube channel and website. If you're in a meeting, please make sure you keep your microphone on mute unless otherwise directed by the host. If for some reason the session ends unexpectedly or you lose connection, please just click the link again and wait to be let back in. Similarly, if the host loses connection, please bear with us. We will do our best to manage any connection issues as and when they occur and may contact you by email if necessary. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear about your experience of our digital festival. Fill out our survey to be in with a chance of winning a prize. Our survey is available at www.glasgowdoorsopendays.org.uk forward slash survey. We hope you enjoy this event. Good afternoon, everybody, um, and thanks very much, Stephen. It's a real pleasure to be able to take part in Glasgow Doors Open Day Digital Festival. Um, and a, it's a, now time to share my screen and start the presentation. So my name is Emily Malcolm and I'm one of the curators at Glasgow Museums um, based at the Riverside Museum and um, my main curatorial remit is our wonderful ship model collection. If you're not familiar with the building, here is Riverside now thankfully back open to the public um, on a ticketing basis. And if you've been in the museum, you'll know that one of our featured collection is our wonderful collection of ship models. We have almost 700 in the collection and they are an internationally important collection really because of the concise geographic um, location that they cover. And um, that's really just ships built on the River Clyde. The vast majority are ships built um, from Rutherglen in the east to um, you know, through the centre of Glasgow, the Partick, a, a Lint House, Clyde Bank, to Dumbarton, Greenock, Port Glasgow, and then down into the Firth of Clyde at Urban and Air. And then a huge spread through time as well. We've got models from the very late 18th century that were built on the river, um, two models that were built throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, and even um, one model that was built in 2007, um, which is our most a recent, recently built ship model. I was quite tickled by um, Stephen's introductory graphics, where we had the very large people looking at the very small buildings. And really, I'm going to be doing the reverse of that today because I'm going to take our little ship models, usually built at 1 to 48 scale, 
and make them as big as I possibly can for you. I thought we may as well embrace um, the restrictions that we're under just now. Um, and instead of trying to show you the models in real life, to go and look at them in a, in a detail that you wouldn't normally be able to see. And because it's doors open day, I thought we should look at some of the sort of architectural features of the models um, and how they're presented to the public to show the interiors of the models themselves. And the one I'm starting with, it's a very attractive model. Um, and like the, the, the five that I'm going to be showing you today, built for exhibition use, so not part of the design of the best vessel, built to display the um, completed ship um, at trade exhibitions, international exhibitions to clients, either in shipyard offices or in ship owning offices. And this is one of that type. It's a model of a steam tug called Flying Cormorant, which was built in 1908 um, for the Clyde Shipping Company by Ferguson Brothers in Port Glasgow. And it's a highly detailed model, lots and lots and lots of fittings. And if I just draw your attention to one section of it here, um, this is the, um, the deck house, which covers the, the engine. And if we were to enlarge that, it's a lovely little wooden structure and the engine is somewhere that gets very hot. Um, and so the roof of the deck house has a uh, six little opening vents. Um, it's got the access door for the crew with a little sliding panel, which gives a little bit more head height for getting down into the vessel. Now I counted up how many fittings are on this single part of the, of the model. And it's something that would fit in the palm of your hand if, if you were looking at it in real life. And there's 122 individual metal fittings fitted there. And that ranges from the individual brass hinges. You've got two portholes in each vent and each porthole has two little brass rods to protect it. We've got the lifting handles. Um, we have the sliding parts and then we've got these two um, metal a, a, arcs which stop the ropes, the two ropes getting entangled in the structure. And then if you scale that up, um, you're looking at you know, a thousand or more pieces on this single model. Uh, and going forward on the vessel, we can hear the detail. The model makers have actually um, created those doors. They've painted them, Indian inked them to look as if they're actually ajar. Um, and in an exhibition that's obviously meant to make you feel of what, what lies behind those little doors, what, what's going on inside. Um, and in the case of Flying Cormorant, it's actually not very much. Um, this model is just, the, the superstructure is just made out of wooden blocks. So the detailing is just an optical illusion. But um, we do have models which do actually allow you to venture inside and see some of the detail um, below deck. Um, so this is a one, oh, this uh, shows a, two sister ships which were built in 1860 um, by Denny Brothers of Dumbarton for G&G Burns. Um, Burns ran services from the River Clyde to Ireland and to England. So um, they were very often operating overnight services to Belfast and Liverpool. And they ordered these two ships in 1860 um, and following their naming theme of always having um, animal kingdom names, they were to be named um, Heron and Ostrich. Now, because they were overnight sailings, they had to provide a little bit more in the way of passenger accommodation. And so this vessel is actually sectioned on the port side to let people have a look inside and see what that actually looks like. Um, it's a slightly unusual sectioning. It's a sort of um, a cutaway section. This is looking at the, the model from the bow. Um, so you have a, a, a cutaway from the very, the, the, the peak of the bow um, back a few, a few inches. And then looking straight on from the port side, you've got two main areas of detail here. Um, forward for the steerage accommodation, and then aft, you have the main cabin, which is first class passengers. Um, if we look at these two areas in detail, we can see something of how it's been um, put together. Uh, the model's entire, almost entirely made of wood. 
and we're looking here at an area which is probably the size of this, your, your hand from fingertips to wrist um, in that little circle there. So very small scale, built at 1 to 48 scale. And it's showing the, um, the bunk beds, which would be provided for overnight third class passengers. Um, and you would be paying to share one of these bunks. Um, the, both vessels could carry a few hundred steerage passengers, um, varying the number of passengers between that and the cargo they carried. Um, and there's also a slightly more select cabin um, just here, which I'll zoom into in the next slide. Um, this a, shows really the quality of the workmanship. This is something which is the length of your index finger. This full screen would be the length of your index finger. And it's showing um, how the model maker has really gone to a huge amount of effort to create the impression of, of quite nice um, panelled woodwork in this model. And a, the woods are a, probably a fruit wood for the lighter wood and then some kind of maple for the dark wood. And it's really usually using fine cabinet making techniques of marquetry to create this lovely impression of panelling here. Um, each of the little bunks has a bit of nice bit of red lining detailing them there. And then even the side sides of each of the, the, the bunk um, uprights, they are have got a nice little bit of moulding down. So a lot of detail in a tiny area. Um, and an image like this also lets you see a little tiny bit of the workmanship as well. Um, when the model maker was varnishing this model, um, his brush didn't quite reach underneath the bench there. So there's a little, you can see the colour of the natural wood as well as the, the completed varnished surface. You'd obviously expect a bit more from the first class um, accommodation. And there we have it, uh, beautifully done out. Now, with the slightly unusual addition of um, fabric used as part of the model making process. So this is showing a beautiful open cabin. Now, at the time when the, when the sister ships were launched, there was actually comment in the press about how nice the cabins on Heron and Ostrich were, how they were high up. They weren't stuck. Um, they weren't stuck down in the bowels of the ship. They were light and airy and, and accessible from the deck uh, and thought to be very, very civilized. Um, the way that this has been detailed um, is a, trying to make it create the atmosphere of a nice, pleasant saloon with, with furniture and carpets. And the carpets of particular interest here, it's been made out of two strips of um, hand-woven a, a tablet weaving, um, which is the kind of weaving that you do to create guitar straps and things. Um, and it would be quite easy to get a bit of fabric that'd be wide enough to cover the whole of that internal space. It's just, it's about the width of your palm. Um, and I, I can't help but think that that's indicating how the real vessel might have been carpeted, that they did just have access to long, narrow strips of sort of this stair carpet in effect. Um, and these would be joined together in the saloon and that the model's actually reflecting what the real vessel would have been furnished like. We do know that they had these big dining tables and these um, shared sofas. And just um, getting another view of that. Uh, you can see the fabric's got a bit grubby on both the um, cabin drapes and the tablecloth, but it's really um, beautifully finished. And this is actually very, very early for um, an exhibition model. A exhibition models really only came into favour in the later 1850s. And this is one of the earliest ones we have in the collection. So I think a lot of the tools and technology weren't in place for miniature working. So a lot of this is it's completely handmade without any machine tools at all. And you can see that in one of the details here, the, 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 the table legs. So I'm enlarge that little bit for you. Um, so these, the table legs and the sofa leg that you can just see just behind it, they have been individually whittled rather than being turned on a lathe. And you'll be able to sort of, if you can retain that image, you'll be able to see ones that are lathe turned later on this afternoon. So um, these have been hand carved with a small carving knife, scalpel type thing, and then put together carefully upholstered in silk and velvet and, um, really giving quite a nice impression that, again, designed to engage the audience um, and 
um, hopefully inspire you with the confidence that the full size vessel will provide the same levels of comfort and luxury. Um, this is a, a view looking slightly forward, and I think that the only unsuccessful bit of the modelling um, really is a, a slightly unconvincing fur rug there, um, which I don't think is maybe weathered that well over the over the past hundred and so, hundred or so years. And it's just some just charming, charming detailing. Um, this little buffet or sideboard um, is the length of your index finger. Um, and is made out of a bottom section, a bottom carved section molded in mahogany or some other hardwood, but then with a, a top layer of a fruit wood. And then the upper surface of that has been painted um, to look like marble. So tiny, tiny piece of furniture. You wouldn't think there'd be any requirement to detail it so finely, but that's that's been done. And again, a lovely little plaster um, mirror above it with a real reflective mirror in it, just to, to add a bit of, of, of texture and interest to the, to the internals. So moving on to our next model, we're sort of jumping forward 18 years in ship technology and in model making. Um, by the 18, late 1870s, um, models are very much part of the sort of international um, a exhibition scene and most people would go to um, a big exhibition expecting to see a really, really top-notch display of ship models and there was a lot of competition between um, companies to um, show their sort of products in the best light they could. Um, this is a vessel called Columba, which was built by Jane G. Thompson for um, David McBrain, um, who ran services uh, in the Firth of Clyde and on the west coast of Scotland. Um, and this is really it's superb, superb workmanship in this model, um, sort of architecturally as well as describing the shape of the hull. Um, if we look at two areas to start with on the upper deck, um, this is the little... Um, bridge area of the, of, of the vessel with um, a, a deck house that is probably the purser's office captain's um, room below it. But the bridge, um, uh, literally bridging the, the, um, the space between the paddle boxes, and beautiful range of detail there, um, cast and turned brass details of ship's wheel, um, the binnacle for the compass, um, and we have three engine room telegraphs, one here centrally, and then one on either side of the vessel, um, really um, revealing the issue with the central steering position on many um, Victorian um, steamers, was that the central position, um, your view forward was obscured by the big uh, red funnel. So you had to have clear views to both port and starboard to be able to maneuver correctly. But it's really the, the woodwork um, of the central deck house that is just superb. And um, this is boxwood, which is one of the finest greens wood. And it is, um, if you're working at this level of detail, it's really the only wood that will give any convincing finish. On many ship models, um, the deck structures are just plain blocks decorated with Indian ink. So it's like a line drawing on a flat surface. But here, every detail has been fully rendered um, just as it would be in the, in the real structure. You have um, the individual panels with lovely pilasters between them. And it's even down to the level of this little louvered vent here on this panel, just to let some air into the, into the little structure. And then a doorknob that's literally smaller than a peppercorn. And then somebody is going to have to slip a, a tiny, tiny key into this keyhole. Um, it's just about the smallest feature you could possibly get on a ship model. Um, then Columba could carry up to 2,000 passengers, which meant there had to be a lot of seating. And again, on ship models, very often the deck, the deck structures are simply blocks of wood which are detailed with Indian ink. Um, this 
uh, model has carried on that fine woodworking um, even onto these little structures. And the, the bench that you're seeing there in the highlighted area, it's actually um, constructed in the same way as the full size bench would be. Um, a individual slats, a individual spacers fastened together and then mounted on these lovely little turned wooden legs. Now there's um, dozens and dozens of these all over the model. Um, fingernail sized little legs. Now these are the, the sort of opposite of the ones that we saw on the heron and ostrich. These are individually um, turned on a, on a lathe, specially designed for working at, at, at miniature scale. So a bit of technology that's come in to, to help with, 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 or has been adopted by the model makers for use at that, at that scale. Um, the real ship Columba, um, quite a lot was written about its particularly luxurious facilities. Um, they had a lovely first class saloon that had uh, writing tables and um, couches and things in it. Um, and this is one of the real features of this model. It actually has a um, modeling uh, below the decks as well. Now I don't have a good photograph of this. It's something that's very hard to, to, um, to capture, but this area here, we're looking um, at the first class aft saloon that has um, paper window drapes, um, real glass windows set into the hull, these lovely little turned um, pilasters dividing them. And enlarging that, we can just peep through the glass, seeing the, um, the drawn on detailing of the panelling within the room, and then just the edge of one of these lovely couches inside. Uh, Columba also had a special ladies' cabin, so women could have a bit of privacy. And this is this area here with um, a opaque glass, so that if the vessel was alongside a pier, the women um, wouldn't be disturbed by anybody peeping in on them. And uh, Columba also had a, a shampooing and hairdressing establishment um, as part of their offer for longer trips. So maybe that's where this that was um, stationed as well. And just to let you see just the detail. So again, a kind of thumbnail sized window, but even this is um, two colors of paint, a little, a little uh, border there, and it's a floral design in the center. But really um, beautifully, beautifully detailed work. Another two areas just to look at quickly. Um, the aft saloon was for first class passengers only. Um, and but the forward saloon was for, for anybody, the forward dining saloon um, where meals were served. Um, and on that forward deck where people will be looking, looking at the view and feeling, feeling the lovely sea air, there's another absolutely charming detail which um, has no kind of technical purpose at all. It's just been put in there for the sheer delight of making something um, attractive and complete. It's this tiny little drinking fountain um, center screen there, um, which would have been particularly useful for third class passengers who maybe maybe weren't, um, uh, you know, didn't have money for multiple cups of tea during the day. Um, and just enlarging that, uh, it's a beautiful silvered metal, silvered casting, silver cast metal um, drinking fountain with three tiny, tiny, tiny um, taps at the top and then two little brass uh, cups hanging on chains. And that was a, quite a traditional way for a water fountain to operate, something that we'd um, be particularly horrified about just now, that you would just take the cup, fill it up, um, drink from it, rinse it out, and then let it hang back down to dry. It's something I'm, that doesn't occur in any other ship model that we have in the collection. Um, and it's uh, such an unusual and charming, charming addition to the piece. And again, um, you can see the, these beautiful turned wooden details, these um, columns that are holding up the upper deck, uh, beautifully turned in boxwood. And for our last bit of Columba, we'll look aft. Um, this is the back of the first class cabin. And part of the writing say that they would serve afternoon tea on the aft deck on sunny days. Um, and it's just to show you the, the quality of the decorative carving that's on board this model. You know, it's not just the kind of architectural structures. And um, this little detail here, um, if I just enlarge that, um, it's a wonderful little piece of carving with scrolls, 
and scallops. And then this tiny, tiny vignette of um, a ship, a yacht at sea, um, done in gold and blue and green, with even um, the sea slightly sculpted there at the bottom. So moving on another <clears throat> 10 years or so, this is another um, G&G Thompson um, model. They were quickly became used to winning prizes for their model at exhibitions. And this is one that they prepared um, of one of their latest vessels um, that they built in 1892, um, the paddle steamer Glen Sanix, which was built for the Glasgow and Southwestern Railway Company. They um, built this model um, specifically to send to exhibition in America uh, the Columbian Exhibition of 1893, and they actually won um, they won an award for this one. Um, it's built at a particularly large scale. Um, it's 1 to 32 instead of 1 to 38, and that really gave them a bit of extra a bit of extra space to play with 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 their with their um, craftsmanship. So, following on from the decorative carving on Columba, um, Glen Sanix has some really beautiful um, uh, paddle box carving. Here's the paddle box here with the red painted paddle mechanism below. And in the center there, we have the, um, the, the crest of the Glasgow and Southwestern Railway Company. I'll just enlarge that. Um, so you have a, the three staffs in the center there. We've got Hera's staff, the distaff for trade, Neptune's trident, and Mercury's staff um, for speed. And that is a um, thumbnail size, a thumbnail size crest, but you know, beautifully painted, beautifully lettered, and um, beautifully highlighted with gold leaf. And then to the left of that is one of my favorite details, which is this hunting dog. There's a stag on the right and a hunting dog on the left. And um, you know, the muzzle is beautifully realized with the mouth and the nose, the eye looks quite bright and perky. And there's multiple colors used on the dog's coat, just, just to create that richness of texture and color um, that they would prepare for a, a model they wanted to win a prize for. Again, Glenn Sanix has absolutely superb um, woodwork on the superstructure, um, all this, uh, all the panelling has been constructed as you would do building a real building and um, there's no kind of no optical illusion here it's all the real thing again done in boxwood um, and one of the nicest pieces is this um, deck house which covers the main companionway down to the main saloon um, and there's a lot of curved wood here and curved glass as well which must be very very difficult to actually achieve um, and to for it to remain stable for you know over 100 120 years and this is one of the models where we have got nice photographs of um, the internal structures of the model um, and this is something that's very very hard to see unless you are actually um, as our photographer was doing here shining a light through the model to try and capture the internal structure oh we're going backwards um, so here this area here is looking through the saloon windows and there's this wonderful staircase descending into the saloon, again, with this beautiful, very, very fine turned woodwork. Um, a, just completing that, that scene there. Now, the last model that we're going to look at is a different, in a different league. Um, in, in, in operation and in times is 20th century. It's a, one of the big Cunard liners, um, Aquitania. Um, built by the successors to G&G Thompson, um, a John Brown and Company. Uh, and they retained this, this pride in their ship models and always wanted to have something that was quite spectacular. So um, Aquitania was a state-of-the-art um, transatlantic liner when she was uh, launched in 1913, when she had her maiden voyage in um, 1914. And both Cunard and Jane G. Browns were rightfully proud of this magnificent steamer. So this is um, a 1 to 96 
scale model. So much smaller scale than normal. Um, but the model makers still haven't, sh they haven't shied away from um, showing some of the internal detail. Uh, this is sectioned on, again, on the court side, and I'll just show you what that looks like. It's quite an unusual section. It's not a full half section. It's not a deck section. It's um, a kind of a three quarter section. If I show you a view from the bow, you can get a better impression of that. Um, it's like someone's taken a slice, a slice off the vessel um, fully down one side. And because of the scale, um, any kind of um, fabrication of the internal spaces would be very, very difficult to achieve, it, to achieve at this scale. So what they've done is actually they have a flat side that's got an absolutely lovely watercolour painting applied to it. Um, and um, again, just fascinating detail, um, which shows a, the kind of the, the social, the social seg segregations within the ship and the divisions between working space and public space. Um, and between the three-dimensional world and the two-dimensional world. Um, if we have a look here, well, this is going along, we have the, um, everything is shown. Um, this is the paint store, this little colored paint tins here, the lamp store. Um, and then in this highlighted area, we've got the carpenter's workshop. And then if I enlarge that, you can see we've got the three-dimensional turned brass uh, windlass capstan here which is linked to the two-dimensional engine in the space below it, which in turn vents up back into 3D world, with this, little, this little vent here, and is next door to the, one of the crew's mess spaces. So moving down the model, again, um, up at the boat deck level, you can see that 3D, 2D division um, with the bridge and the captain's accommodation just here um, and you can also see some of the really lavish first class spaces um, over to the right we have the first class staircase descending through the levels to the gymnasium and swimming pool the first class passengers also have their um, designated lift there um, and in this area which I circled if I enlarge that um, it's showing you um, what's most, the most exclusive passenger accommodation available on the Atlantic in those days. Um, Cunard had asked for these very special open air suites um, called the Gainsborough and Vanborough suites. Um, and they were advertised as being a four bedroomed um, private suites with external access if people wanted to travel in um, luxury and privacy. Uh, and you can see lovely little details of people in their bedrooms getting dressed, um, a, the crew um, looking at plan chart, charts on a table. Uh, and really it's almost like a little, a little storybook laid out for you to create, to create your own image of what's going on. With. And this is the center section. And this really shows something that none of the other models do. It's showing you the kind of the, 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 the engineering side of it as well with engines and boilers um, and then the, the, the bunkers for oil. And then it's not, it's, it's not just concentrating on the passengers. It's showing you the, the workers, um, the stokers, the engineers hard at work below decks. And then um, you can sort of travel up through the social strata as well. Um, we have the third class dining room here um, at the bottom, just above the engines. So um, noisy, vibration, probably a bit of smell and um, going up through one of the luggage areas. And then you have the, the very luxurious first class um, Louis the 16th dining room, um, one of the most exclusive spaces on, on, the, on the vessel, a double height space, which is quite hard to um, interpret from the from the from the the, 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 the watercolor there, um, but I was able to find um, a little photograph of that area, which shows that the gentlemen on this level they're actually up on that gallery looking down on the elegant drawing room below. And I think if you look at things like the columns with their ionic capitals, that's all been translated across into the drawing, um, either from the real life vessel photographs or from the plans. So a lot of wonderful detail. Um, 
there in the centre section. And just looking aft, just to sort of even things up a bit, um, you know, we've got the first class smoking room on the upper deck, um, but then aft we've got um, the, the uh, deck chair store uh, and then the um, entrance to the second class accommodation with their entranceway and their stairs and their little smaller gymnasium there at the bottom. Um, there we go, there's the gymnasium there. And again, I was able to find a photograph online which just shows the top of those stairs looking down. Um, so second class was certainly not, you know, it, it was it was it was no um, no cheap seat um, in in uh, on board Aquitania. Still a very luxurious, elegant space. Uh, and so that's just a final view of the lovely, lovely model of the Aquitania. And this is one of the ones that you can see if you come on one of our store tours when we restart them at the Glasgow Museum Resources Centre. And um, I hope that's given you a little introduction to something that you wouldn't we wouldn't normally be able to show you in any scenario um, at the museum. It's something that we've only been able to do online thanks to the wonderful photography that we had done for our um, ship model catalogue, which we published last year. Um, and our wonderful staff photographers, my colleagues, Jim Dunn and Iona Shepherd, made a wonderful job of, of really capturing the essence of some of these lovely ship models. Um, uh, for use in the catalogue and and use use today. So that's the the end of of my of my of my talk, and a, yeah, that's just a little bit of um, gravy um, uh, animation that my son thought I really should have as part of my presentation. Um, so any questions? Um, is Ralph? Hello, yes. Hello, Ralph. Um, do we have any questions? Yes, there's a couple of questions come through. The one that came quite early on, so you might have dealt with it. Who, who would have made these? Was it someone who worked at the shipping companies? Maybe you could say a bit more about what... Why. Yes, well, I mean, that's, that's as fascinating as the models themselves. It's, um, there were two different sort of routes of model making. Model making was quite a tradition within the shipyard because it was part of the design the design process of building the ship to make a plain half hull model, which would show the, the, the shape of the hull. Um, and in the 1850s, this developed into showing models that you had made and then elaborating on those into the sort of full hull models that we've been looking at today. So models could be made in the shipyard and very often shipyards employed model makers. They could employ more than one model maker. Um, a, the sort of the big three Clyde Yards, John Brown's, Jeannie Thompson, John Brown's, um, Fairfields and Denny's, they all employed more than one model maker in-house or the models could be made um, by commercial model making firms. It's a, a sort of a, an industry that grew up alongside shipbuilding and engineering in Glasgow that people often needed models um, commercially. So there's quite a number of commercial firms who could make a model of a, a ship or a, 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 a bridge or a, you know, a, crane um, and individually the model makers are often fascinating people the, the very early one we, we know a little bit about the model maker himself it's a chap called Edward Johnson um, who'd been brought up from England by Denny's because of his ability as a model maker to work for the firm so I mean, it's, a, it's 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 a whole um, talk in itself really talking about the model makers and how they worked but fascinating thanks for the question yeah, that's, I was going to say that's the same. The same kind of question came in from John S about you know who were the model makers and did each ship builder have their own? And I think you've definitely you've definitely covered that there. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by the uh, oh no, I don't. Someone else has come in. Ken, um, were models always made for uh, military vessels for the navy? Um, the model of the HMS Hood is wonderful. Um, when was it made? So. Yeah, yeah, I suppose this is one about, about military vessels, about naval mm. vessels. It's so much well, the way it, of the collection. Yeah, the, Clyde, the Clyde was quite a latecomer to shipbuilding um, and really missed out on the, the sort of 17th and 18th century period when um, England and Britain's Navy was based around the great big sort of wooden walled ships. Um, and there was a, a, a really... A, a, great tradition of warship building in England um, by the big, you know, the big 
Thames Yard, South Coast Yard. And these are these the Admiralty models that um, we have um, just a few examples of in the collection, none of which were built on the Clyde. But this was a thing that the that the that the, that the Navy, the Navy Board would use to um, discuss the format of ships and, and sort of to show to the king to persuade him that he needed to invest in a, a wonderful new ship. So there's that whole tradition in England with the English yard. And it doesn't quite translate the same into the to Scottish shipbuilding that the, the naval vessels that are built, the, the models of naval vessels that are built in Scottish yards, they still are for that display function. Um, you know, it's it's either for the Navy to show at exhibition or the the, um, the HMS Hood model was actually owned by um, John Brown and Company, and they used that on sort of on their own account um, to show at exhibitions because they were intensely proud of this this wonderful ship that they built. So I don't know if that does that answer the question. Yes, I I, I think that does. Continuing with the sort of military theme, I know one of the things I find fascinating is these. We have a couple, don't we? Ones that are made by the prisoners of war, the Napoleonic prisoners of war. These yes. Made out of bone no, they're, and hair. They're, they're superb. Um, kind of what can be, you know, the, the models we've been talking about today. Um, they're really showing what can be created if you have a whole suite of tools and materials at your disposal. And the Napoleonic prisoners of war are showing what people can create from rubbish really and um, these were the wonderful models um made from food waste from the bones from meat bones um horse hair um hoof hoof and horn um and then sold to make um sort of pin money by prisoners and they're lovely absolutely wonderful um i and quite a number of them made in in, in Scotland there were uh, Napoleonic prisoners um, held at Edinburgh Castle and uh, um in Midlothian Gorebridge. So yeah, again, a, a different, a whole different talk could be done on that one subject alone. From John S. again. So what maintenance and or restoration required to keep the models presentable? I think that's uh, I think that's uh, well, it's, it's it's that's that's also a really really interesting question. Um, you know, when we were looking at the Glen Sanex model. Um, that's barely been touched over 120 years because it's it's built in such a way that they've they've inbuilt quality and stability within it. You know, really top quality wood, well seasoned wood that's not warping and twisting, top quality paint finish. Um, often they'd be using 10 or 15 layers of of very very um, thin paint to, to achieve a, a really dense surface. Um, and that's really a quality that we can't achieve. It's very difficult for, 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 for that to be restored in anything like the same quality, the same fashion. So we try to be as hands off as possible today. Um, my, my conservation colleagues, Andy Howe and Jacek Boklo, they it's mainly cleaning and um, restoring broken elements in a sensitive way so that you can see what they've been like originally but we, we in no area of the museum do we sort of attempt full restorations now but most of those models incredibly stable structures very well made and it's a sort of testament to the craftsmanship of the builders that they are in such good condition generally. Well, that's great well we've had I've just noticed there's a chat box as well as the Q&A there's been some great um, positive feedback for you people really, really loving the, the details, the tiny photos. Someone asking about um, accessing the recording. Th these talks will be on the YouTube channel and the website. As accessing well. the what, sorry, Ralph? Um, the recording of the, of the talk. Oh, yes. Um, I, think, I think Stephen said that it was being recorded and um, it would be available on the, the YouTube channel. Um, and I, I think they'd need to direct the question to them if they weren't sure how yeah. to navigate towards that but I think on the website it's all quite well set out. Yeah I think there's also much appreciated plans to give zoom talks in the museum once return to normal working um, 
and the model makers would be a good starting subject. That's great. Well, I think um, I think we're I think, going I think to something again. that we've all sort of come to appreciate yeah. that the digital world is something that it's not just it's not just a sort of temporary replacement for a lot of things. There are things that we can do digitally that we just can't do in the museum. Okay, and if, if, you, if I think, do, yeah. I, mean, I think, would you agree with that, Ralph? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That that you know these new technologies are going to be ways of mm. engaging with, with our collections in in different ways. But uh, yeah, no, there's lots of lots of great uh, feedback coming through, and. I think, yes, people who've remembered the ship models from the time at Kelvin Grove as well. Oh, remembered no, that's wonderful. Photographs, and you can see all the, the ship models there. So we've got, we've got viewers who've, who've remembered that <laughs> as well. Well, I mean, and this is, where, this is where the digital world falls down because it'd be so nice just to all be in a room together and be able to have a nice chat. <laughs> Um, yeah. And this is very distance. Just it just it, it's it's so sad, isn't it, that we can't just share these things together. Um, and it's it, but it's 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 gaining with one hand and losing with the other, isn't it? But I think we're all looking forward to the time where we can get back to a bit more a bit more um, of normality in the way of access to the collections and, yeah. and public events. Definitely, definitely. There's just to, to say to our viewers, there's, um, there's a link being posted to the, the talks um, to the Glasgow Doors Open Days website there. So oh, wonderful. Great. Um, I think, well, that's been absolutely brilliant. Oh, um, well, yeah. well, just if I could say to everyone that's watching, if, you know, if you're interested, please keep in touch as things as things develop. Um, it would be lovely to hear from you, lovely to get comments and... Um, uh, thanks so much for coming today. Brilliant. Right, well, that's over and out. Okay, thank that's you. That's over and out from Ralph and I. Thank you for coming. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Goodbye. Bye.